Good evening, everyone. Um, if you've been watching us all along, you'll notice that the stage is a little different than it was, and now we have two cameras. We have, we're, um, if we're not careful, we're going to look professional here in a minute. Um, but things, things are uh, things are progressing, um, and it is uh, September the 20th at 6 p.m. Uh, we're down here at Streetlight as always, um, and. Streetlight is a totally volunteer organization. If anybody has any interest of serving, we we uh, we serve the the homeless um, on uh, um, two Saturdays a month, which is the second and fourth Saturdays, starting at um, 3:30 to quarter to four. We get here, um, but anyway, um, we're going to get started, and I think tonight's message is going to be interesting. Um, I've only. Uh, and we're, we're trying a lot of new things tonight, um, new programming, new new camera angles, new. So hopefully we're gonna we're we're gonna do this in a professional manner. We're gonna try anyway. Um, so um, be a little patient with us if we do make a mistake, but things will things will progress. Um, so I'm gonna get started. We're gonna pray, and then we're gonna get started. Heavenly Father, we glorify you and we thank you that you love us and that you teach us. You give us all of the wisdom and the knowledge that is available to this to us here. And we thank you that you have given us um, your son so that we have a place with you for all eternity. And we glorify you in your precious name. Amen. Um, so we'll get started now. Um, most of you would know that this is a menorah. Um, menorah represents Jesus and what we're going to do tonight um, as this is going to probably go over the next two to two to three for two for sure the next two teachings and carry over possibly into a third but um, but we're going to show that um, that the word of God is so in-depth and so detailed that there's no way it could have been done with any by anyone other than God that's the whole intention of this, and it shows you the depth and the meaning of what God is teaching us. Because, unfortunately, there are many seminaries and there are many pastors, and I know many of them who are teaching now or being taught, um, and professors in seminaries who are teaching that the Bible is not the Word of God. It's just a book of history. And that may shock some of you. I tell a lot of people that, and they can't believe what they're hearing. I know a lot of pastors who have never read read majority of the Bible because they don't believe it's the Word of God. These are all sad facts that tell us where the state of the church is, and it was very similar to what Jesus explained what the what the times that we're living in would look like. So we're going to start and we're going to compare these things. This being the menorah, um, now it, it, it's not hard to see that there are um, seven branches of the menorah, including the center. The center branch is called the servant branch. Now, the servant branch obviously represents Jesus because he is the suffering servant. Um, and and in this, we're gonna I'm gonna attempt to do it to give a, a detailed description of 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 why that would be Jesus and in the and the six branches that it's that the center branch is holding up are part of the seven churches. The center one being the seventh church. Um, and we're going we're gonna to go through and, and show the in-depth meaning of the menorah. Bedashit. Bedashit is the first, it is not only the, the first book of the Bible, but it is the first word of the Bible. Bedashit means in the beginning. We call the book Genesis, but in Hebrew it's Bedashit. Um, unless you're European Jew, and then that would be Bereshish. They, they would say with a, ending with an S instead of T. More information than you need. Um, um, Bereshit bara, um, Elohim, Aloftav, Hashamoim, Ba'et, Aaretz. Now, in the beginning, created God. Aloftav represents God, which is Jesus. Um, in the beginning, cre um, created God through his son Jesus, the heavens and the earth. Now, where does that come from? I'm going to go back and forth with this. Jeremiah 1, verses 11 and 12. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, What do you see, Jeremiah? 
I answered, I see an almond branch. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. So, no, I'm sorry, the, the almond branch um, is, is a representation of his word. And, and, I, and if you look at John chapter 1, verse 1, it says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So this is the, the, the word is Jesus. And God, to, through the prophet Jeremiah, said that this is his, that the almond branch is his word. So each of these being an almond branch. Now, the thing you don't see here, I, I tried to find the best menorah on, online I could find, and I, I am so grateful to my, my daughter-in-law who, who helped me figure out how to do it. She knows, but she taught me, which means she's a great teacher. <laughs> she can teach me. She, um, because I, I don't pick things up that quickly as far as computer. So um, anyway, um, I wanted to find a menorah that had a flame and... Uh, the, the actual menorah, if you look in the description of how to build the menorah in the book of Exodus, um, it will actually say that at the top of those bowls, or under, just underneath the bowls, there would be an, an almond blossom. So this almond branch would have an al almond blossom, which would then be topped with the bowl, and the bowl filled with oil, which represents the Holy Spirit. And then you would light that, and then the Holy Spirit brings power and fire, just as... It's mentioned throughout Scripture that um, whether it's uh, the, the Jews when they pass through the Red Sea or in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, where it says that the, the Jews were baptized walking through the sea and then they were baptized under the cloud um, by day once they crossed, but by night they traveled by fire, which the Holy Spirit, the, the first one was baptism of water. The, when they got to the other side under the cloud, they were being baptized by the Spirit. And then that brought about the fire, which is power, as we know. And, and if you know the story of the, the Jewish people in the Sinai, their sandals never wore out, their clothes never wore out. Um, they, were, they were supernaturally fed by manna that fell from heaven. When they complained, God rained waist-deep quail um, for them to eat, so much so that they got sick and choked. Um, so... <clears throat> There's many way, many reasons why we know that the that the almond that the menorah is a representation of Jesus and of the Holy Spirit. So now I'm going to go forward again. <clears throat> now, as I read that to you, it, it reads in Hebrew as um, in the beginning created God through His Son Jesus, the Aleph and the Tav, um, the heavens and the earth. Well, in Colossians, if you if you know me and you've known me long enough. Um, you guys all know that I, 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 want, I don't like to teach on something unless I have a verse from both the original covenant and the New, Co the new Testament, the New Covenant. Because they are the same words, they're just different sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the, sh the, 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 sh the sheep and the goats were a symbol of Jesus. And in the New Testament, we have Jesus. So one is just a foretelling of, of, the, one, of the next. So Colossians 1 14 through 16, in him, Jesus, we have redemption, the re release of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth. In seen, I can't see, there's a glare. glare. <clears throat> the seen and the unseen, whether thrones or angelic powers or rulers of authorities. So it's, it's basic, this is saying that that all things were created by his Father through the Son, and which is the exact same thing as the very first verse of, of Genesis chapter 1, um, verse 1. Um, and, and, and because we know that the, that the Trinity is one God, my, our little brains can't, can't I, I, I don't know, we can't sort out how you can be three and one even though we are created in his image, but all those things and they have different responsibilities. But... We know that the Shema, um, Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Proof of God's sovereignty. Now this, um, I'm going to try and stay non-political because I don't like to get political. But it's very difficult not to because it's one side, a liberal side of our society that wants to remove God from everything. 
And, and here's, we have allowed that to happen in our schools. We've allowed that to happen in our, in our politics. And now we've allowed it actually to happen in our churches, where now the things that God has ordained, we question and we argue. It divides denominations. It divides people. So here's what gets me frustrated. This, this is just something I wrote up here. <clears throat> we are not to use science to prove the Bible is correct, but rather use the Bible to determine whether your science is correct. Because we know that the Bible is accurate. So if I'm going to try and say that, well, the Bible can't be correct because it doesn't match evolution. Well, evolution doesn't match the Bible. <laughs> the, the Bible, throughout history, we have believed that the Bible is the word of God. Now, we may have had arguments over translations and and um, because we want, and people pushed agendas and, and had their own translations. But we at least acknowledge that the Bible was the word of God. Now, what it meant was a whole different story. But now we say it's not the word of God. Well, wait a minute. There's no evidence of evolution. Zero. And if you look at the the group of people who are pushing these agendas, their, their two greatest gods are evolution and, global, and, and climate change, um, neither of which are supported by scripture. So which one is correct, scripture or science? Their science. Just because you call something science doesn't make it good science. So I am just wanted to make that point. Now, here's it. I do believe in climate change, and I do believe it's man-caused. But not because we drive um, um, semis or run energy factories with coal or, heaven forbid, cows have flatulence. Any of those things. It is Romans 1, ver verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been. Now stay with me for a little while. Ask the animals. That's a strange statement unless you understand truly what God said in, in Genesis, that even animals have a spirit, not an eternal spirit. They don't have a spirit of God. They have a spirit from God. When they die, they are not eternal beings because they do not possess the spirit of God, but they do have a spirit. And I'm going to show you that. Um, Job chapter 12, verse 7, 7 through 10. Ask the animals. They will teach you. Now, that's something. We think we're the higher being, but he's saying, no, the animals will teach you. You don't see animals rejecting God. You don't see the nature rejecting God. You don't, you don't see those things. You don't see the birds rejecting God. But you do see man. Speak to the earth, and it will teach you, um, or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of these uh, does, not, does not know that the hand of the Lord has, has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. Now it goes back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 6, where it says he breathed a breath into Adam. Now why did, it, it sounds like he repeated the same thing twice, breathed a breath. Why would, why would he say that? Because breathed, ruach, which is a wind or a breath or a breathing, um, or it can be spirit also. Um, but he breathed a ruach, but that's not what he breathed into Adam. It says he breathed a breath into Adam. That breath there is nashem. It's the word nashem, which means, uh, na means the, shem means name, the name. What name is that? Well, every Jewish person would know what that name is. It's Yeho uh, Yehovah. He breathed himself into Adam, which gave Adam power, authority, um, and, and knowledge and wisdom. But, the, but, the la but the, the, he did not give him the knowledge of good and evil. That's the only thing he held back. Everything else he said, I give you authority over every creeping thing, over every beast of the field, and, and as high as the fowls fly. So in that first heaven is where the height of the, the highest flying bird, I don't know what bird that is. I know there are eagles or, or vultures that may go up two, three, four, five miles. But he gave mankind the authority to that level, to where the birds flew. Mankind, Adam, turned around and gave it to Satan. Satan had it for 4,000 years until Jesus said, uh-uh, the kingdom of heaven is near. Now I take it back. Um, kingdom of God is a place. Kingdom of heaven is, a, is the operating system of heaven, which is power and authority. So I know I've kind of gotten off track. A couple more rabbit trails, Jack, sorry. 
Um, and proof of God's sovereignty. Um, this is Job continued. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing joy. Isaiah 55, 12. Yeah, yes, you will go out with joy and, and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break for, before you with singing and all the trees of the field. Psalm 98, 7 through 9. Let, let the sea roar and all within it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the, let the mountains sing for joy together before Adonai, for he is coming to judge the earth. Uh, he will judge the world with righteousness and fairness. Are you seeing a pattern? I mean, the, the earth is rejoicing. They're singing. They're, they're clapping their hands. I mean, these are, these are things that we would not think of. It's because we think earthly terms, and God doesn't. Um, Luke 19.40, I tell you, if these were to stop speaking, the very stones would cry out. He's talking about his disciples. He's saying that the stones would cry out. So it's over and over. Immediately he spoke to them, take courage, do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with, with them, and the wind stopped. They were dumbfounded, uh, for they did not understand about the loaves. Instead, their hearts were hardened. Now, if you're wondering what um, translation I'm reading, I'm reading the Tree of Life version, which is a version translated by 30 different Messianic Jewish rabbis. Um, then, then they, the disciples, said to him, uh, what shall we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered, this is the work of God, to trust or to have faith in the one he sent. So if we are... If we are to do, uh, he said, when, when we're asking, what shall we do to perform the works of God? He's saying um, to trust in the one who I sent, which is his son. Here's, here's the part about um, climate change. Uh, claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for an image in the form of mortal man and birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them over to evil desires of their hearts to, um, to impurity, to dishonor their bodies with one another. They traded the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creation rather than the creator who, ble who, uh, who is blessed forever. Romans 8, 19, for creation eagerly awaits the revelation of the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? Because it does say that, I didn't put it up here, but the, but it does say that the sons of that the that the earth has been eagerly awaiting the return or the coming of the sons of God, which is or the no, it's the revealing of the sons of God is what it says, um, because since Adam sinned, he was he and Eve were, well, he, Adam was sons of God. Has not been seen since that day. It, the the earth is anxiously awaiting the return of righteous men and women on this planet again, which we will see during the millennial reign. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because one man subjected it in hope. Creation itself also will be set free from bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of the children of God, for creation groans together with birth pains until now. Now, where do we hear the word birth pains again? I mean, he's talking about it's, it's groaning with birth pains. And then Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 8, all things are, are, are only the beginning of birth pains. He's talking about all the things. The first signs that he depicted would be at the time of the end. He said these are birth pains. He's, he, he was saying the same thing in Romans. He was saying the same thing. In, in the very beginning of the Bible, these are birth pains. You will see the signs of my coming. There were, there were birth pains um, in his first coming as far as, 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 as he got closer to the day of his crucifixion, the, the signs um, and the prophecies that he was fulfilling just rapidly increased in frequency, getting closer and closer together, just like he said it'll be that way. And there's so many similarities between his first coming and his second coming except that in his first coming, he was coming as a lamb. There's no lamb. He, these are, 
These are teeth of a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay, so now we're moving into the menorah phase. Um, we're going to take Bedashit. Um, Bedashit would represent um, the church of Ephesus. Um, you're going to see as we go that each of these branches will represent one of the seven churches listed in the book of Revelation. Day one of creation. Um, we're going to talk about um, day, day, the days of creation are actually prophetic utterances of what was to come and, and they actually point to a feast day and that feast day points to a, a, a something that Jesus would accomplish into the, in the future. So day one of creation, Genesis uh, 1, verses 3 through 5. Um, in, in Genesis 1, 3 through 5, God's created light. He said, light be. Now, light be was Jesus because he did not create the sun, the moon, and the stars yet. Light be was, he said, son, go down there um, and you're going you're gonna to be the creator. Uh, I'm going to create through you. We, we talked about that earlier. And then Passover is the very first feast day um, of which the day, the first day of creation is pointing to. And I'm going to explain that. Revelation um, 2, verses 1 through 7, this is a description um, of the church of Ephesus. And, and I do believe, this is, that I, I'm going to come make sure you know this, that this is my opinion that the seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation are actually stages of the church from, from the coming of Christ in his first coming to the coming of Christ in his second coming, the stages that the church went through. And, I'll, and we're going to, you can disagree with me, that's fine, because this, this is my opinion. There's very little I try and put, get, put my opinion into, but this is one of them. These things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, lampstand being a menorah, which we're talking about, I, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. You tested those who say that they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You have persevered and have and and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Um, and what was their first love? It was love itself. They loved their neighbors and they loved God, and they became bold, they became arrogant, they became, um, um, their hearts became hardened. Um, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come uh, to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place uh, unless you repent. This you have, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Um, which is hating evil, which was a good, he, he's saying that's a good thing. But the love for your neighbors, your other churches, the unbelievers, the love that they shared with people was absent. Luke 3.13, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all perish. That's, um, that's what he's saying. Unless you, unless you repent, uh, I will remove your lampstand from its place. The loveless church. <coughs> 1 John 4, 8, he who does not love does not know God. So if we want to make excuses and say, yeah, but you don't know how bad somebody treated me. You don't know what my neighbor said behind my back. You don't know, you don't know, you don't know. Well, you know what I don't know? Is how many people wanted Jesus dead? How many people talked behind his back? How, and, and he allowed himself. He didn't have to. He said it himself. Do you not know? That if I, if I ask my father for a legion of angels, he would send them? He said, but I get, no one takes my life. I, I give it freely. So I've heard many people say, well, the Jews killed Jesus. No, they didn't. I think we're all sinners. He came and died for sin. Didn't say Jewish sin. It says he came to die for sin. And there was sin long before there were Jews. The first Jew was Jacob, which was 2,500 years after the creation of Adam. So everyone before that was a Gentile. They all sinned. So don't tell me that, God, that Jesus was killed by the Jews. He was killed by all of us. 
because he loved us. First um, Peter four eight, love covers a multitude of sin. That tells you what kind of credibility God gives puts on love. Love is number one. I don't want to say this because it's it's later in in the message, but Matthew twenty two thirty seven through forty. He, Jesus, said to him, You shall love Adonai, the Father, with all your heart and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law, or teaching, um, and the prophets hang on these two commandments. That's the verse I was just talking about. That um, that everything that Jesus said is, um, is based on love. If you go to... Uh, Galatians 5.14, it says, if you love your neighbor, you've completed the law. If you go to Romans 13.8, it says, if you love your neighbor, um, if you love another, it says, you have fulfilled the law. So if you love, we've talked about this before, if I love my neighbor, I won't steal his truck from the driveway, I won't break into his garage, I, I won't try and seduce his wife I won't I won't covet whatever he's got I won't I won't do that why because I love my neighbor and if he loves me he won't do it to me so in, in if we if we follow what God had said we're not to be focused on the law because the law will cause you to sin that's what scripture says but but if we don't focus on those you've heard me say it before I love donuts but I haven't had a donut in, I don't know 10, 15 years, because I can't just eat one. I'll eat a dozen. So I stay away from them. But if I sit at home on my couch watching TV and say, boy, I'm not going to eat a donut, I'm not going to eat a donut, I'm not going to eat a donut. I live in Jenison. I know um, within an hour I'll be down at Sprinkles getting a dozen to bring them home to watch TV with. Because no matter whether I'm thinking positively or negatively about a donut, what am I thinking of? A donut. So he's saying, don't pay attention to the sin, because if you just sit and dwell on the sin, you're eventually going to do it. So don't dwell on that. Dwell on loving God and loving your neighbor. It will wash out any impure thoughts you have. Matter of fact, I thought it, I thought it was interesting. I just I don't even. I, you you were there. We just heard this. Um, at a Jewish synagogue, a Jewish church meeting. Um, there was a gentleman there that was at a, a lunch with a friend who claimed to be a believer in Jesus. And, and um, there were two of them there. That, uh, one was not a believer and the other one was. And then there was the third guy that was telling the story. And he said that this man that said he was a believer because the other guy wasn't and he was trying to impress him as a customer or whatever. He was using profanity nonstop. So the one man who did, who knew Jesus reached over at another table and grabbed a bottle of ketchup and stuck it in the center of the table. And he said, you know, just for the rest of this lunch, because, you know, you're a believer, I'm a believer, um, let's, uh, let's pretend that this bottle of ketchup is Jesus. And he said the profanity stopped like that. And it was just a symbolism that this bottle of ketchup who really could care less whether this guy is swearing or not. But in this man's mind, he was saying, oh, if Jesus was sitting here, would I say this? And obviously the answer was no, because he stopped swearing. So this is the point I'm trying to make here, is that if I focus on Jesus or I focus on my neighbor, I'm not going to want to do, you know, am I going to invite Jesus over to commit a sin? I don't think so. So if I focus on Jesus, I'm inviting him into my thought process, my mind, or I'm inviting my neighbor, which is part, which is a commandment of God to love my neighbor. I'm not going to invite him over to do that kind of stuff either because I want to be able to witness to this man or woman. Um, so that's all I'm trying to say is that we need to alter our, our, our thought process as to the law. Yeah, well, the law has been fulfilled, not replaced. Um, Jesus fulfilled it so we could move into a new covenant. Somebody had to fulfill it, and Jesus did. But that, uh, he said, but not one, not one comma or one period from the law has been replaced. 
it's still in effect. It's just um, because I have had many people say, well, the law is gone. And I say, so it's okay to murder now? It's okay to commit adultery? It's okay to steal? It's okay to lie? It's okay? Well, no. I said, that's the law. So either it's gone or it's not gone. It's just, where's your focus? The law can't save me. Because if you're going to try and say that I, that I have to perform the law to be saved, then you have to fulfill the whole law. All 613. Good luck with that. They couldn't do it in the Old Testament because they were focused on the law because it was the law that gave them the, the right to be forgiven eventually. But, but it's not about that. It's about I want to honor God and I want to honor my neighbor. Therefore, I, I'm gonna, I, I, don't, I won't do these things. That's all I'm saying. Oops. Genesis 1, 3 through 5. Then God said, light be. And there was light. So Jesus, um, um, Jesus being the light. Um, and here's a couple of examples of that. Uh, John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have life, light of the light. Um, John 9, 5. As long as I am the light of the world, I, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. In John 12, 46, as, as light, I have come into the world so that everyone who trusts in, in me should not remain in darkness. Now that, that first, uh, the, the first feast day is Passover. Well, if Jesus is the symbol of, of the light, or the light is actually a symbol of Jesus, and the first feast day is about Passover, well, who's Passover about? Passover is about Jesus. So it leads into the, the light being all about Jesus, Passover being all about the Lamb of God, which is Jesus. So the first day of light being is the prophetic utterance of the coming of the, of the Passover. Second day of creation, bara, which is created, word created, Church of Smyrna. Day two of creation, Genesis 1-6. Um, it was a command for the firmament to be. Now, if we look at what, what when, how he created the firmament, firmament is, is a word that represents sky. So if you look at the, the, the well, I'm gonna, I'll go there. Um, Here's Genesis. Here's the creation. Genesis 1, verses 6 through 8. Then God said, um, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Now, that may be confusing, but if this is the way the Bible describes um, the way it was created. There was an earth, and then there was a it was in a bubble of water. And, and so when he says that he created a firmament and he caused the, the, the waters to separate, he commanded this bubble to release the inner half of that bubble and that, and that became the waters of the oceans and the waters of the aquifers under the, under the earth. That void that was left when that inner half of water was, was brought down to earth is called sky, firmament. Now that, that thicker layer, the thick layer of water that was on the outside of the sky, that was a protective barrier so that man could live forever because it filtered out the UV rays of the sun. So it was a filter barrier um, to keep us from doing that. So what, what, what he did was he separated water from water and created sky. So I'll finish reading this. Um, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Follow what I'm saying? Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters from which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, the first heaven. We know there are three heavens. Um, so the evening and the morning were the second day. Jesus again was the light of the second day. When he came down to, 
to um, create, it was day. And we went home back to heaven with his father, it was night on the earth. So we see that the, that the waters are separated. Um, this, uh, the third, the second feast day is unleavened bread. So what is unleavened bread? Um, leaven, as we know, and Jesus talked about it in the New Testament, that leaven is the example of sin. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, their sin. So to take the Jewish people had to take all leaven out of their homes, even sweep the corners of their kitchens, the corners of everything. They could not have leaven, and it was to be discarded. Um, um, so in that, what were they doing? They were separating themselves from the world. So on the, on the second day of creation, God is separating the water from the water. On the second feast day, he's separating people from people. He's separating the people of God from the world. That's, that's what sanctification is. Now, I don't have this in my notes, but I'm gonna, I'll, I'll bring it up from the point of the very first cup of Passover, which we talked about in the first day of creation, is um, sanctification, to be set apart. It's exactly describing what we're seeing here on the second day. Um, the second cup being affliction, the third cup, which is Jesus, or Jesus excused Judas between the second and third cup because the third cup is redemption. There was no redemption for Judas. Um, and the fourth cup being the cup of, um, oh, we just talked about this at Mr. Berger in Hudsonville. Um, um, the fourth cup is the cup of consummation, which is done at the wedding supper of the Lamb during the tribulation after the rapture. Anyway, I'm off on another tangent. Sorry, Jack. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. So now we're being sanctified, set apart. Um, we're removing sin. So we went to the Passover lamb, which is the symbol of Jesus, on the first day. Um, we're now going into the second day where we're being separated, sanctified um, um, from the people of God, from the people of the world. Um, and, and we're doing this and we're, and we're removing sin from our life, um, which is Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you shall have a holy con uh, convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. You shall make an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. Okay. Now Smyrna. Again, this is this is the second day of creation, the second church. Um, second phase of the church. These things say the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I, I know you, um, your work. I know you. Um, work, work, I must have had a typo. I know your works of tribu uh, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I, and I know a blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. Um, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do you not fear any of those uh, of the those things which you are about to suffer? Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. Uh, you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit um, says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Um, so S Smyrna has actually been a faithful phase of the church, is what, what he is saying in this, in this message. So um, now we've seen the second day of creation being s separation or sanctification. Um, <laughs> I like to think the water is being sanctified from the water, separated. 
um, just as mankind were being sanctified and separated. Okay, now we're on to day three. Elohim. Pergamum is the third church mentioned in the book of Revelation. Day three of creation. Genesis 1, 9 through 13. I'm going to go back to these when I get to them. Um, gather the land and the sea. And then first fruits is the feast day. Now first fruits was done on the first day of the week following Passover. So pa- the, the Sabbath would fall on a Saturday and the first day of the week would be Sunday. So the, the, first, the Sunday following Passover, whatever day that fell on, um, would be a first fruit. Now, first fruit was a gathering together. We see that. And on the third day of creation, um, the land and the sea were gathered together. It says that the land was brought together. Now we have land masses for people to live on, and we have sea for places where fish to live in. So they were separated. Now um, the water was gathered to water, and the land was gathered to land. And I, I even... Even uh, some of the historians will say that, that at one time all of the land masses were connected so that these animals could move from all around the earth or even mankind could. Um, I want to go to the day of creation of the third day. Then God said, The waters under the heavens be gathered together into a place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw it was good. That's exactly what we were talking about. On first first roots, they were to go to their field and gather everyone, whether if they were uh, farmers, they would gather part of their crop. If they were sheep herders, they would gather um, a sheep. If they were cattle ranchers, they would bring uh, um, a, a baby cow. And they would bring them into the synagogue on first fruits. Um, so it was the gathering of what they had to bring to one place in, into the same place, which is the synagogue. Then God said to the earth, bring forth grass, um, the, the herbs that yield seed and the first trees that, that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herbs that uh, the herb that yield seed according to its kind, and the trees that yield fruit, whose seed in itself according to its kind, God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Um, so this being Pergamum, this is what is said about um, per- the church of Pergamum. These things, uh, he who has the sharp two-edged sword I know your works and where you dwell. Pergama uh, was in modern-day Turkey, that we would call Turkey today, where Satan's throne is. You hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the, in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. I have a few things against you because you have um, there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Now, if you remember the story of Balaam and Balak, um, Balaam was a priest who God, or who Balak commissioned and paid to speak curses over, stand on a mountaintop and and curse Israel. Um, But every time he tried to curse Israel, he spoke blessings over him. Um, and which didn't make Balak very happy, especially seeing he had just paid him to do what he did, you know, to do what he told him to do. And if you remember the story, it's in Numbers chapter 21, I believe, where um, it was actually the donkey. Again, we're talking about animals, no God, but the man did not. Um, he, He kept beating and cursing at the donkey because it wouldn't go through this little valley And the donkey could see that there was an angel with a sword ready to cut up Balaam's head if he walked through there. And and so the donkey was protecting Balaam's life 
But Balaam couldn't see it because he was too blinded by his own arrogance. And he was beating the donkey who was just saving his life. Um, he put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Uh, thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Verse 17, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, on that stone a new name, written which no one knows except him who receives it. I think that's really interesting um, that, that God himself is going to give us. We have a secret name in heaven. Now, I think of all the people who lived, um, me being a Michael, there's a lot of Michaels. I ran into a bunch of them just two Saturdays ago at the synagogue. Um, um, but uh, in heaven... There won't be anyone with a duplicate name. I think that's really mind-blowing to me. I don't know how many people will be there, a billion, two billion, five billion. I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to do four, and then we're going to end with four. Four is a long one, but... Um, the... Thyatira is the ch fourth church, day four of creation. Genesis chapter six, verse fourteen through nineteen, is the description of that of that day of creation. Created the sun and the moon, and the in the feast day that that um, associates with it is Pentecost. Um, boy, there's a lot in this one. Um, I'm going to start here, I think. Um, with Thyatira, to the, to the angel of the Messiah's community in Thyatira, write, Thus says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like polished bronze. I know your deeds and your love and, and faith and service and patience and, and patient endurance, and that your last deeds are greater than your first. But this I have against you, that you tolerate that, that woman Jezebel, um, who calls herself a prophetess, yet she is teaching and deceiving my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her immorality. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses. Oh, I doubled up on that. Um, verse 22, Behold, I will throw her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her doings, I will also strike her children with a deadly disease. Then all of Messiah's communities will know that I am the one who searches minds and hearts, and I will give to, to each of you according to your deeds. Um, on this, the uh, fourth day of creation, then God said, Lights be in the expanse of the sky for the separating of day and night. Uh, they will be for signs and for seasons. In Hebrew, that word they're used for, for um, um, the, is, is moedim, for seasons, or moed, which means the appointed times, which are the feast days that we're talking about. He's brought into the, to this that these are, these are appointed times where you are to come to me, stand before me, and I'll give you specific instructions, which he did in Leviticus 23, as to what you are to do on those days, and that they will be holy. They will be for the lights um, in the expanse of the sky to shine upon the land as it, as it was. Now, the sun and the moon, the sun was to separate day and night, so the sun is a representation of who? Jesus. He is the light of the world. So the sun becomes a symbol or a type and a shadow of Jesus. Um, and it was to separate day and night. 
and it was to give us uh, signs in the heavens because Jesus, God used signs to cause the Jewish people to move around through, through, through the Middle East um, and to know their calendars because he would give them new moons on the first of Nisan and the first of Tishri, which are the celebration months of the feast days. So all of those, th those things were done that, um, as far as um, for signs in heaven and then for the, se we call it seasons, but it's a bad translation. It's actually the appointed times. So those are why the things he put in the sky. But now that being a type and a shadow of Jesus, um, being the fourth day, the, Jew the Jews of Jesus' day believed that the Messiah would come before the end of the fourth thousand years because they, they knew from back then that each day was a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. That doesn't mean that it was 7,000 or 6,000 years of creation. It wasn't. But each day represented a thousand year future prediction of what that next thousand years would be. So, so in the fourth day of creation, being the light of the world, the Messiah, the light of the world, would be created in that time frame. So as it got closer to the end of that fourth millennium, the Jews got so sick and tired of false messiahs coming into Jerusalem and claiming they were the Messiah, they said, we've got to come up with a method on how we're going to determine whether these people who are, are claiming to be a Messiah, whether they are or not. Because they fully expected him to be coming before that 4,000 years after the creation of Adam. <clears throat> so they went to the, the, the book of Isaiah, chapter 35, and they withdrew three items, one of which is he would heal a blind man from birth. Um, he would um, raise a man from the dead, and he would cast out a mute demon. And then they went to the Talmud, and they pulled out um, a passage from the leper Messiah that he would hire, uh, heal a leper who was, um, uh, who was cursed by the church. And so um, that's why you see when Jesus healed the leper, there were actually 10 of them, he, what did he say to them? Go show yourself to the rabbis. Why? Because that was a rule they, an edict that they gave that the Messiah would have to do. Um, when he healed the blind man who was blind from birth, he did it in the temple court at the pool of Bethsaida. Now, they obviously knew about that. They called him in front of the, the priests and said, you weren't really blind. They were try they're, trying to, they're trying to cast dispersions on everything he did. They knew when he had resurrected uh, Lazarus. So they, they knew that the fourth day had, had the, the, the Messiah would be in their presence by the end of that fourth day, or they believed that anyway. So that's why you see all of these things the way, the way all the ways they reacted, because the, he didn't, he came, but not in the way that they, they wanted to see. Oops. Then God made two great lights, the greater light for uh, dominion over the day and the lesser light, uh, as well as the stars for dominion over the night. God set them in the expanse of the sky uh, to shine on the land and to have dominion over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. Um, uh, God saw that it was good. So there was uh, evening and there was morning the fourth day. Now, we call this Pentecost, but it's actually in Hebrew, Shavuot. And Shavuot, is actually different than what we think of as Pentecost being a singular day. But you are to count from the day after the Passover Sabbath, which we talked about earlier, if, if Passover fell on a Thursday and Saturday was a Sabbath, the first day of the week following that, Sunday, would be, um, uh, you would start counting for Shavuot. And you would count seven weeks. So seven weeks would be seven Saturdays later, and then you add one to that, which would be the 50th day, which is another day of first fruits, which is Pentecost. 
Pentecost Sunday to us as Gentiles. Um, so you are to count from after um, Passover Sabbath, from the day that you brought the Omer, the first fruit, of the wave offering, seven complete Shabbat. Um, until the day after the seventh Shabbat, you are to count 50 days. 49 days of preparing the body, physically and spiritually, to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, why do I say that? Because for those 49 days, they were, they, they were, to, they were to search themselves to weed out all unrighteousness, to make amends with their... It's very similar to Teshuvah in the, in the fall. Um, um, and they were um, to, to be thanking God as they walked into, the, into, the, into nature for all of the, the crops that they grew or the, 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 the sheep or the goats or, the, or the, the, the oxen, whatever it was, they were to be thankful to God for all that he had given them for that 49 days. What they were doing was purifying their temple, the body. That's why Jesus said, don't you know your body is a temple? They were purifying the temple for what? The 50th day to receive the Holy Spirit. Because he wasn't going to dwell in a building anymore. If you're full of the Holy Spirit and you walk into your church, guess what? Your church is full of the Holy Spirit, even if it doesn't have it. Because you walked in. That's incredible to me. Um, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. There shall be seven years of seven times and 62 um, times of seven years and seven weeks. According to Ezra, the temple was complete. So that temple, um, just like the temple of our body was, is to be purified to receive the Holy Spirit for 49 days, the earthly temple, the second temple of Israel, was, was from the time that the decree was given to build the church, the temple, there were 49 years to the, to the day that it was sanctified and ready to be worshipped. So that, uh, that, that 62 um, times of seven later was the very day that Jesus rode in on a donkey. And there's a whole calculation that I show you that, but I don't have time. And that's, that's a whole nother story. BC. 49 years later, 490 years from, from 457 BC, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And that 490 is 62 weeks. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Luke 9, 23. Then Jesus said to everyone, If anyone wants to follow me, he must deny himself or to die to himself. Um, take up his cross every day and follow me. So we have to make a decision every day. Am I going to follow Jesus? I don't know. Today's a tough day. I got an important contract. I might have to lie a little bit. I might have to, I'm, I might have to, to even take somebody out and do, you know, give show them a good time on the on the town, even though if it, it may not be righteous. Who am I? Who am I? Am I a follower of Jesus? I think I, if I am, I think I need to act like. It. Shavuot or Feast of Week. The Torah teaching of God. It is 49 days of gratitude for all God has given, culminating on the 50th day with a first fruit offering. <clears throat> Leviticus 25, 3 and 4. Um, for six years you may sow your field, and for set, six years you may um, prune your vineyard and gather its fruits. In the seventh year, there is to be a Sabbath rest up for the land. Next teaching, we're, we're, we're going to dive into the Sabbath rest. And it's, 
It's amazing. Um, in the seventh year, there is a Sabbath rest for the land, a Shabbat to Adonai. Uh, you are not to sow your field or prune your vineyard on that seventh year. Uh, Genesis 2, 3. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. For on it, he ceased from all his work that God created for the purpose of preparing. Leviticus 25, 8 through 10. You are to count off seven sh uh, Shabbat of years, seven times seven, so that the time is 49 years. Uh, then on the 10th day of the seventh month on Yom Kippur, you are to sound a shofar blast and, and you, are, um, you are to sound the shofar all throughout the land. You are to make the 50th year holy and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee to, um, to you when each of you is to return to his own property and each of you is to return to his own family. So even in this, so for seven years, six years, they were allowed to sow and to reap, to, to gather and to eat. Um, but in that seventh year, just like on um, in the Sinai, I mean, all these things go back. It's amazing how they just keep piling on top of each other. In the Sinai, they were not allowed to harvest anything. They had to pick a double portion on Saturday or on Friday so that, because they weren't allowed to harvest or pick up the, the, the manna on, on Saturday, the Sabbath. Well, here... Um, for, four, for, for seven sh Shemitahs, seven, a Shemitah is seven years, and that would be seven times they're not allowed, seven years that they're not allowed to plant or sow or to reap. Um, but on that 50th time, if, if you were to have bought land from me 49 years ago or even 29 years ago, on a jubilee year, you had, to give it, you had to give it back to me on the remaining balance that you owed me. I had to pay you back for it, but it became mine. Now people say, why, why is that important? Because I hear all these false presentations that, 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 that God blanket immigration. He's not. He set up the rules of Israel so that it, no matter what they did, if they got into financial trouble, if they got into all kinds of things that the land turned over to someone who was not a Jew, after at, on a jubilee year, that was going back to the Jew because it was a protection to keep the land of Israel for the people of God. But unfortunately, the people of God walked away from God. So for the last 1948 years, that it's 1800 and something because it was 70 AD when they lost. It's all, you know, I mean, it, it all just matches. It all fits. It all, it's just incredible to me. Okay, Daniel 9, 24. Seven concerning your people and your holy city to put an end to the transgression, to bring sin to an end, to atone for it, bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the holy of holies. Um, Daniel 9.25, 50 days, and then present a new grain offering to Adonai, first fruit. Genesis 1.14, then God said, lights be in the expanse of the sky, separate day and night, and then um, which are the appointed times. that made sense if it didn't you know I would you know we have a comment section if you need a further question answered you can say whatever you want um, preferably it would be polite and nice but um, but uh, in two more weeks the first Monday of uh, boy October already um, we will be discussing the second half of, of the feast days and and what that means for us today. So I appreciate you listening, and um, we're, we're, we're uh, done for tonight, because um, I don't think you want to hear me for another hour, hour and a half. So anyway, um, 
we will conclude. And I thank you for all you've done. And remember, Streetlight can always use another volunteer if you're interested. Second and fourth Saturdays of the month. 3.30 to 4 o'clock. Right here, 515 South Division. Go ahead.